Good morning to all. I am Sandil Kumar, Deputy Director working in uh, um, yes, Satish Dhawan Space Center, Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO Stringer Equata. I am uh, sitting in front of you to just explain about the World Space Week 2022, what we are uh, celebrating um, all over ISRO centers, various centers of ISRO, around 10 centers are celebrating this as part of an United Nation effort to recognize space and also the space efforts. So it all started in 1957, October 4th, when the first uh, uh, the artificial satellite, the natural satellite being moon, and uh, the artificial satellite, the first artificial satellite is a Sputnik 1. That spacecraft was injected into an orbit uh, by the uh, erstwhile USSR unit. Uh, that uh, even started uh, with uh, the space exploration for humankind. Again, after 10 years in 1967, October 10th, United Nations formulated guidelines which has been accepted by a majority of the countries on how to use the space only for peaceful activities. So these two events, October 4th and October 10th, spanned over a period of 10 years between 57 and 67, has been recognized by United Nations again in 1999, they started, asked all countries to celebrate the World Space Week as the week between October 4th and 10th of October every year. So this year, each year there will be a theme for uh, uh, celebrating the World Space Week. The main aim of the celebration is to um, explain to the general public as well as the students about the space activities which can be useful for the humankind first. Second one is to make different programs which can induce the interest among the participants about the space activities. And third one to conduct uh, various talks on space activities by experts across the world. So right now um, for the previous years, many countries started participating in this event. Today, we are seeing almost 90 countries uh, are participating in the World Space Week event worldwide. And uh, it is not only the spacefaring or uh, nations which are participating in the events, even countries like, uh, uh, you can say, European countries, few European countries which are not having any space infrastructure, African countries, South American continent uh, countries, they are also participating in these events. They are using space activities uh, and uh, benefits of the space activities for their day to day purposes, but they don't have a full infrastructure. Still, they are celebrating that is only to ensure that the future of the country is prospering because of this uh, particular interest inculcated in the human uh, brain. And uh, here, uh, just to talk about. Uh, um, ISRO. ISRO is uh, um, founded by Government of India and specifically the job has been given to Dr. Vikram Sarabhai way back in 1960s and uh, the department has come out of uh, um, uh, Department of Atomic Energy and uh, started as a Department of Space. And uh, the main purpose of uh, the genesis of ISRO is to only uh, make activities which are having direct um, help for the common man of India. And that way the organization started modestly and the first launch pad was at Tumba in Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, later it was called, after his uh, demesis. And uh, the um, Tumba equatorial launch pad was uh, even though developed by India. It was dedicated to the all the nations of the world. So it was a, a unique uh, launch site wherein um, uh, smaller rockets at that time uh, were launched from, brought by various countries and launched from the Indian soil. Being closer to the equator, it is having lot of advantages. So having lesser energy required to put an object in space and it was well utilized by the other countries. 
and uh, same way the ISRO also developed um, different divisions uh, um, started making uh, explorations on the space activities from a very small scale it has as on date it is a well fledged uh, well fully developed uh, um, space agency uh, competing among the other space agencies of the world so nasa is uh, one of the um, team leader you can say in space activities their uh, uss nasa is uh, budget itself is more than twice that of the second next uh, uh, space faring country so we match with our technical expertise and the um, um, and the activities on the space equally with uh, many of the space faring countries starting with uh, usa and nasa and then ESA European Space Agency and the erstwhile Soviet uh, um, um, Space Agency now being taken by Russia and of course China uh, and other uh, countries. Japanese is also having a Japanese Space Agency. And uh, again in particularly about uh, talking about the Stigiri Kota, what we do here, uh, it is called as Satish Dhawan Space Center after in memory of uh, our uh, uh, second uh, um, uh, chairman of uh, ISRO who has taken over from Vikram Sarabhai. So this Satish Savan Space Center is the spaceport of India as far as uh, India is concerned subsequent to Thumba wherein smaller rockets only were launched. It was having some constraints regarding the safety criteria where lot of population was in and around that place. So a yeah, launch site was uh, explored by in the, among the Indian coast, coastal region and uh, Strigarikota was chosen and it was a very good uh, um, candidate which has passed for this uh, activity having a um, more 80 kilometer uh, uh, coastline and a very sparsely populated um, even now. Uh, the total island is uh, dedicated for space activities of India. And the launch pads here got developed and we have um, now state of the art launch complexes here for launching our uh, workers of uh, ISRO's launch vehicle being polar satellite launch vehicle which puts satellite up to 14-25 kg in a circular polar circular orbit. I mean that is from the satellite will um, go around the earth from pole to pole, from north pole to south pole. And that way when the earth is rotating um, east to west and uh, this uh, satellite rotates around the earth from north to south, it can cover each and every inch of the planet. So the solar polar satellite uh, launch vehicles which launches this uh, polar satellites have a unique advantage of covering each and every place of interest for our activities. So it is having wide uh, variety of applications, uh, the satellites put by PSLVs uh, in uh, getting all the weather data required and for mapping which is very essential now, the population burst also uh, creates lot of constraints on keeping the boundaries of the um, towns, cities, states and other regions. So it has been well monitored by this type of spacecrafts. And of course the next class of satellite is GSLV um, um, class of satellites. Um, the GSLV launch vehicle is uh, geostationary launch vehicle meant for launching geostationary satellites. And uh, as the name suggests, it goes up to 36,000 kilometer from Earth and uh, it rotates around the earth in east to west um, orbit. And the 36,000 kilometers is having a unique advantage of any object rotating there with uh, the given angular velocity. Matching with that of the earth will ensure that all the time the satellite cameras which are facing the earth will see the earth at a particular spot. So that way it is very useful for uh, communications mainly and uh, the telecommunication now is uh, so advanced that 
uh, even though standby underground uh, underwater laid uh, cables are there connecting continents the communication is uh, uh, prime mode is through the satellite uh, only so on the next we have uh, in a hybrid uh, next class of uh, launch vehicle gsle mark 3 which is very useful and uh, very um, you can say uh, technically advanced vehicle than gsle mark 2 which has been talked about earlier they have a capability of high lift capacity as each uh, launch vehicle they have uh, a certain limitation on the total weight of the satellite which can be launched from that vehicle so with uh, gsle mark 3 that uh, limitation can be um, uh, opened up and we can put multiple satellites in a single through a single vehicle or we can put a sat single satellite of high mass so that is the advantage of this and of course now the world is shrinking from a bigger uh, conventional telephone what we used to see earlier uh, now they all have come down in size to a tiny uh, mobile phones all of us will be using it so the technology is uh, in the um, uh, in the direction of shrinking everything and uh, of course this is also well applicable for uh, satellites which are uh, uh, manufactured and put uh, in orbit right from the day one to now so the size is coming down but the miniature electronics and uh, the cameras and other instruments they are doing a better function than the conventional old one if you take the old satellites they were even uh, to the size of a mini bus and now they are uh, in the class of nowadays people start calling that as micro satellites and nano satellites based on their sizes and of course uh, we have in isro uh, launch vehicle program uh, very successful programs like uh, launching 100 satellites in a psle launch vehicle um, and then the chandrayaan launch uh, um, which has occurred again first time chandrayaan 1 through a PSLV. chandrayaan 2 uh, we had attempted from a gsle mark 3 vehicle and uh, a variety of major successful missions so mangalyan again that is another mission which has been uh, launched from PSLV launch vehicle so the race for uh, occupying space has prompted many other countries to invest a lot of money as well as um, to uh, develop the scientific culture towards uh, the space exploration because one is the limited space in earth earth is being exploited in many ways either by population or by other uh, um, pollution what we are creating ourselves which may in a future date may make the planet unlivable so you require an alternate place for the human race to survive second one is total energy resources in this earth it is all mostly they are all spendable it is not uh, renewable energy it is a spendable energy so it is slowly coming down and at one point of time we may not have enough resources to fuel the population what we have what we may face in future so we require more uh, resources to be tapped from elsewhere than from earth so when we talk about that type of situations for our futures children so then we naturally have to look up uh, to space and uh, look at the ways of uh, economically tapping those resources from the other celestial bodies. Nearest celestial body to us is the moon. Moon is a barren rock. Um, uh, people say that uh, in fact uh, when moon was created, so it, uh, it was uh, hot molten um, lava type of uh, thing and slowly it got cooled and uh, uh, there are uh, precious uh, uh, minerals which are entrapped into the moon's soil and one such thing is a helium-3 gas which was there in earth but slowly it got um, 
it got uh, risen um, and it has gone into the space and we don't have that uh, particular helium-3 gas which is now available in our nearest celestial body that is a moon. From the soil, if we heat the soil to a um, manageable temperature, we, that uh, helium gas will come out of that uh, soil and that can be tapped. That is the main purpose of uh, many of the uh, right now uh, countries which have put satellites uh, to the moon, landing on the moon and uh, what experiments they do. All are for a future way of tapping this helium-3 gas. Helium-3's uh, purpose is for nuclear fusion. Uh, uh, in a contained way, we can conduct nuclear fusion and the energy coming out of nuclear fusion using that helium-3 will be so tremendous that you, a whole city can be, um, uh, energy needs of a whole city can be met by a small matchbox uh, type of uh, volume of uh, the reactor, fusion reactor. So right now nuclear fusion reactors only are there to produce energy and uh, nuclear fusion reactors many countries are uh, um, trying to uh, make it operational in a commercial way and for that the helium-3 gas is required. Next one is colonization. So as uh, I was telling earlier when the earth is going to become uninhabitable for our uh, future generations. We may have to look for uh, other areas in the celestial um, uh, planets to occupy and probably live there. So for that uh, moon is one of the bright candidates which is nearby because it is easy for us to go from here to there and come back. So other than that uh, you have Mars, you have um, gas giants in the form of uh, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, all the things. The, as a gas giant, a bigger planet, it may not be um, possible to live, but uh, they found that some of the moons of uh, such planets, they are in 20s, 30s numbers. Some of the things are, um, can be uh, made it as uh, a habitable uh, future thing. This is how uh, um, uh, everybody looks at space and uh, the purpose of World Space Week is to only inculcate this type of interest in our next generation of children as well as uh, parents who can motivate their children to enter into this uh, area of uh, interest. So STEM as we say science, technology, engineering and mathematics is the core area where um, the future generation people can um, concentrate and uh, develop themselves as well as the population um, in and around where they work. So this uh, space activity is a part of that STEM and uh, definitely the um, um, government as well as uh, the um, mankind who are living in India, they will benefit a lot uh, by making the interest inculcated in the younger children on these areas. So other than that, uh, there are uh, um, umpteen number of uh, advantages in space like uh, you can have space transportation uh, which uh, uh, like uh, space, space tourism like what we are going right now. We can have a better, uh, um, uh, I mean a satisfying moment by going into the zero gravity and come back for uh, the um, people who are interested in such activities. And uh, See, one side of the coin is that we want to um, expand, tap uh, energy, get more information, all those things. Other side of the coin is what we had put as artificial satellites or as part of uh, the vehicles which have gone to put that satellite on the space. Some of the um, um, things are still orbiting the earth which is called as a space debris. It is a major uh, issue coming up uh, uh, in the near future when the earth is surrounded by a um, empty number of uh, millions of uh, tiny objects which are rotating which don't have any uh, use anymore to the humankind but uh, they can create enough trouble for uh, putting other satellites in their place. They can hit even 
you could, you could have um, uh, noticed that the costliest, highly complex uh, um, <coughs> James Webb telescope, which has been launched in the beginning of the year, it uh, was partially um, uh, was damaged by one of the space debris uh, or meteorite when it has uh, uh, put in the orbit. That is a type of uh, damage which can cause and uh, even international space station occasionally are facing this problem of debris points, uh, arctic particles which are coming in uh, slightly uh, damaging some of the instruments. So, this space debris how to remove it and bring it back to earth or remove it that is another challenge what many people are facing it. In every front India as a whole and ISRO as its prime space organ they are trying to settle down these issues by one by one by dedicatedly putting research and development activities in these areas. And even though ISRO is doing, we look forward and uh, open our arms uh, wide open for uh, anybody who is interested in uh, entering into this areas and uh, help uh, the Indian government and the Indian population again to uh, compete uh, equally with other nations in, in these areas. And the recent uh, government of India also has uh, put in a lot of uh, thrust in space area, formulating the space policy, uh, which is very essential for uh, running the space industry, thriving space industry here, and uh, encouraging various startups to tie up with ISRO and uh, take the space activity to the next level. So, already there are uh, many Indian startups which have, you, you, some are startups, some can be now termed as a full fledged space industry, which are uh, um, uh, very well developing many of the components uh, which are required for other country space uh, vehicles also. There are, uh, they are all exportable market uh, which is uh, very, very essential for uh, Indian economy to thrive upon. Uh, India known for uh, its uh, um, human brain, brain kind. So, the uh, amount of technical prowess what uh, we had shown outside on IT industry that can be well um, tapped and channelized in this uh, developing this uh, space business as a major uh, organ of uh, the export market for India. That is what is uh, government is aiming at and putting full fledged effort in uh, doing that thing. And already ISRO equal organ like um, uh, in space has been created exclusively for this type of activity. Then coming back to Stereoricota, now Stereoricota is full fledged having two launch pads and uh, um, India's uh, and uh, one of the world's biggest uh, solid motor production two plants are there here. We make the manufacture the uh, rocket motors. May being solid propellant is one of the um, um, chemical way of uh, energy which can be produced which can give the enough thrust for lifting the um, uh, total rocket from the ground to the top. So, the solid motors are being produced at Stigarikota because it is too heavy uh, each segment they call that itself will be in the order of 150 tons. So, and uh, this uh, um, motors if it is being produced elsewhere it will pose a lot of uh, safety issues to bring it to this uh, launch station. So, they are all being made in house at Stigarikota itself. Propulsion side we have the solid propellant as I was telling a chemical um, um, slurry which uh, like a cement it is a slurry which can be produced and manufactured and made to um, get cast as uh, cement is cast as metal iron, iron ore, uh, iron molten iron is made into a useful object. So, similar way this uh, uh, solid propellant is also it is a mixture of um, uh, different uh, chemicals which have been uh, which is available in solid form as well as in some other uh, form which finally when molded together and cast they become a solid 
mass. So, it is having lot of energy the, um, for uh, carrying as a rocket fuel. Second one is a liquid uh, fuel, uh, many of us will be knowing that uh, 1969 when Neil Armstrong went to the moon, they used a rocket which used liquid oxygen and kerosene aviation fuel. So, they are the liquid engines, of course the liquid engine can be two types, one the liquid will exist in the liquid form in the room temperature which is called the earth storable liquids and the next one is cryogenic fluids because they, those liquids will form will be in the form of liquid only if it is chilled down to a very cold temperature otherwise it will evaporate and become a gas. So, the purpose of using a cryogenic fuel is to uh, contain more uh, amount of uh, mass of um, the propellant in the liquid form so that uh, you can store more um, mass in a smaller volume. So, that was the idea with which uh, this has been uh, uh, used worldwide and of course, uh, we have the other ion propulsion, nuclear propulsion, these type of things uh, which are um, useful for having higher thrust, but they cannot be made uh, in a larger scale. They are all more used for uh, uh, satellite uh, minor thrust controls. So, next uh, um, uh, continuing with uh, the launch vehicles, where is the future for this launch vehicles? Launch vehicles are also uh, simply right now the um, you can say uh, 50 percent of the mass of the uh, empty rocket vehicle is the tankages, tankages for storing the liquids. Again such liquids when it is burnt they have to burn through an engine, liquid engine. That liquid engine weight will also be almost 50 percent of the uh, mass of a total uh, launch vehicle. So, that is a type of, uh, they are not useful also. Uh, over a period of time, they have to carry the dead mass. So, the um, future is to um, develop such tankages which are very light and engines which are sacrificial by themselves as it gets burnt and goes up. So, um, that is a um, way the students, college students um, and others can think how best we can uh, make this industry, thriving industry even more successful and even more uh, original thinking can be put in to get a optimal launch vehicle which can sacrifice itself as it goes up so that its dead mass can be reduced and we can put more weight in the um, uh, satellite what it carries. So, that is a, um, a concepts of various um, developmental launch vehicles. Similar way in uh, communication when a rocket goes up a small you can say a mass, a small cube it is nothing but a satellite is nothing but a small cube, that cube is having some instruments inside that and that instrument has to work in the zero gravity in space. So, that instruments have to be miniaturized and at the same time it should be well insulated in such a way that the uh, face of the satellite which is facing the sun is getting um, heated up, whether the other face which is facing the other side of the sun is uh, facing virtually a very cold temperature. So, both temperature difference it has to withstand as well as the instruments have to work. So, a lot of scope is there for uh, um, um, research and development and original thinking which can improve upon these uh, um, uh, uh, both the rockets as well as satellites which are being used uh, worldwide for the almost 50 years now. So, still lot of improvements can be done and made it as a make it as a very um, uh, useful thing uh, and at the same time very cost effective way of putting a um, instrument in the space. This is how the um, uh, things are brightening up everywhere and lot of uh, researches are going on also and uh, all these researches uh, are right now going on in research institutions let us say and the research institutions depend on 
many of the educational institutions, the people who can help in such activity. And the educational institution again can come up only if a good primary education is given in imparted in the school level. So it all boils down to the youngest mind, maybe a primary school uh, student whose mind is unpolluted with uh, um, uh, any other uh, biased uh, thinking. So he can have the original thinking as he uh, grows up. So that is the correct age where people can be, um, their focus can be channelized towards these type of cutting edge areas, cutting edge technology areas. So they can really get molded and uh, this World Space Week will help in uh, molding. Our aim is we are, uh, Satish Dhawan Space Center is uh, for this year we are conducting at eight venues uh, spanning over four uh, states. And uh, if we can uh, make at least few students in primary school uh, level to take, take a pledge and take this uh, space uh, education and space activities as their uh, future uh, um, uh, aim, then the objective is well achieved. So, and next to is the primary students, next to that it comes to the college students. College students, from their conventional way of uh, learning uh, a curriculum, uh, they can slightly think, open up their mind, think uh, around and uh, um, get into activities uh, such as this one and uh, it is not uh, earlier I mentioned STEM, it is not only STEM, there are so many avenues in space related industry that uh, even a biologist, a geologist, um, a biomedical person, all of them can uh, form part of the team. Uh, whatever education they do, they can uh, always come into this area and uh, first getting proud of uh, doing such a work, next one really contributing to the Indian economy. Uh, and uh, this is the main objective of uh, the World Space Week and uh, I hope that uh, you all would have um, got some glimpse of what is happening in ISRO's uh, centers, various centers. And uh, we would love to hear from you uh, in future also. And uh, uh, both the students and parents who are participating in these uh, activities, my sincere request is that uh, kindly uh, spread this message to uh, the nearest, dearest ones in, in, in and around you, in your schools, in your offices, wherever it is, and uh, try to canvas uh, for ISRO uh, and for uh, UN, United Nations, that uh, the space activity can be uh, the one best thing for their future uh, children. Thank you.